Oh no! Yeah. You can send a so um hello everyone and welcome back to the just seminar um so it's a pleasure to uh introduce our speaker today professor gilbert Gakken. Uh, so Gilbert is actually uh, one of the founders of JIST. Uh, so um, uh, a very, uh, very impressive CV. Uh, he's um, uh, in the University of uh, Northumbria and, and Sunderland. And um, yeah, sorry, I'm just uh, loading the right uh, full bio. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, he will be talking to us today about uh, creating trouble with dots and joints. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to your talk. I'll not take much time. So uh, yeah, we're very okay. excited to, to to hear your talk today. And uh, yeah, thank you, Mohammed. So I, I bumped into Mohammed again. It uh, interact this year. Uh, done a keynote at the the British conference beforehand and said introduced myself and said that being a founder of Gist and Mohammed said, oh, you have to come and give a talk. So um, so this is a bit of a historical talk. And uh, as you said, I've uh, not totally retired yet, but uh, so. It's it's a bit of history. So uh, this is what I was first doing at, uh, in my PhD in Glasgow. And then when I picked up PhD students, they moved me a bit on. I'll explain all of these as I go uh, as to what's happening. But it's essentially really when you, you might think that there was a period where we weren't doing user-centered design here, but we weren't really because the contextual design book wasn't written until 1995 um user testing was going in the 1980s but user-centered design really got up to speed and we were quite lucky with steve clark's phd that um he started troubling that quite early on and and that's led on to all sorts of things so let's talk about uh times at, uh, at glasgow so got a bit of latin there memoranda not memoranda not things because the thing about user-centered design there's all these things that you have to take account and it's also the case with sustainable design and any hyphenated designs, the things that you have to have to be on the agenda from the outset, whereas memorat are things that were remembered. And uh, for the first part of only uh, it, as an interaction designer, I was a school teacher, I was developing e-learning programs, I wrote games programs as well. And, and the connections were very, the joins were very much within the artifact itself. It was just a good, you know, a question of having a first stab at something, reflecting on it and, and taking it further forward. Uh, and in this period, I went, as I said, from being a, a school teacher, PhD student, two postdocs lecture, and then finally got my PhD because they were the good old days when uh, <laughs> you eventually did your PhD because you had to, because you were doing more interesting things. So there you go. That's uh, the first year of GIST. It was uh, a year we were originally called Gucci, the Glasgow University Consortium on Kai. Um, but, but for whatever reason, we, we went and changed that. Um, so you'll recognize Phil there, Alistair Kilgour, myself, and then other ones. I put this up on Facebook, and Graham Hutton down at Nottingham says, I actually recognize half the people there. Tunde Cockshot, who's still around, and uh, Fraser Orr, who was the postdoc with me on John Patterson's project at the other side at the back there. So I'm not going to go into this lot of detail, but the, we... I think in the early days of HCI in Britain, a lot of the activity was within computer science departments, and we felt we had to look like computer scientists. Um, and it was some time before we started doing any fancy human-oriented stuff. So my PhD was on architecture and abstraction in interactive systems. And these are some of the publications that were uh, arose during my PhD. And that's a, a rather complex diagram there. Um, we were originally working with linear pipelines, um, language models, the Zeheim model, and uh, I, I'd published adaptations to that. Um, but this was in the, this was really before object-oriented, it was as object-oriented uh, programming and design was breaking that we we thought that actually we, we needed a much more modular architecture. And Joel Coutas in Grenoble, who was in the IFIT working group with me, where we published this 
team team written monograph. I don't think there's been many of those around um, that develop this, but I won't go into the details. That it really doesn't matter. And also, so architecture abstraction. The early dialogue specifications again were linear, using um, Bacchus Nauer form grammars, using state transition networks. Then GUIs come along, and everything becomes interleaved. And it was either or. Um, you could either specify something that was highly concurrent, or you could specify something that was linear. And one of the things I, I came up with generative transition networks that actually let you slide all the way from linear to completely concurrent. Um, and uh, just to show that we looked like computer scientists, we used LaTeX before people in Kai got forced to use it. So, I mean, the, the key point about this early work was that it was user centric in the sense that it was designer as user centric. We were thinking about what the designer wanted to do. So in specification notations, interface styles were originally linear, menus, forms, question and answer, command languages. Um, and then with GUIs coming in, they got highly interleaved. And you really want both. And you can sort of spot platforms these days. Um, and going back to the architecture, one of the things I didn't mention is that you can't do things like, there's a load of meta stuff like undoing and history and interrupts that you can't do in the main part of an architecture. And that shows in a lot of mobile apps these days. A lot of them don't have undoing. It's quite hard to put in. And text, I believe you can, I think an, app, an iPhone, you can shake it to undo your text input, but I've never been able to get that to work. So a lot, a lot gets lost when you can only do um, concurrent interaction. And then, as so I've mentioned that, meta capabilities, separability. There was a big debate in the 80s as to whether you could separate the user interface software from the rest of the application. Uh, the answer is no, but what you could do was split it in three. And that came back again in databases as business objects. If you put a central layer in, you've actually got a lot of modularity. So what we were interested in was support and analysis and reflection, avoiding unhelpful constraints, and whether they were intelligible or not. But it was, it was designer-centered rather than user-centered. And then in the 90s, you could actually get HCI PhD students. Phil and I had started teaching HCI4 in the good old days at um, Glasgow Computing when there were 40 credit modules, they were gorgeous. Um, and then Steve replaced me on HCI4. Um, so Stephen Clark came out of that. We taught HCI second, third, fourth year, and then there was information engineering in the first year. So by the time they got through that 40 credit module, they were in really good shape. I picked up Darren Lavery from Harriet Watt, we done the masters there. And they what they do HCI stuff, not uh, not com formal computer science stuff or software stuff. Um, what have I done? I've broken it. <laughs> Where did that come from? As I was saying earlier, you can tell that I uh, so um this was an interesting period in my life. I was a part-time lecturer here. Um we'd moved out to time staff my wife's job, she was a doctor, so I looked after the kids on a Friday, picked up a part-time job as a consultant, then picked up a part-time job as a reader. I was twice 100% on payroll looking after the kids a day, a week, and doing consultancy. It was brilliant. I, I thoroughly recommend part-time work because you can say that's your day, I'm finished. Uh, but actually, for the bulk of this period, uh, I was a full-time professor at uh, Sunderland where I got a research chair and, and I had to go full-time because there's no way of making that post part-time. So Steve was looking at the relationship. So again, just as contextual design's breaking, before the book was published, Karen Holtzblatt published in CACM, and Stephen was very taken with that. Um, the argument being, here's all these systems that fail because people don't understand the context of use. Therefore, if you research the context of use, your designs will be successful. Now, in, in logic, that's called modus tollens and it's bollocks. Um, just because you know the cause of something bad doesn't mean that addressing that will, will completely fix the problem. And Darren was very concerned with a lot of evaluation methods, particularly inspection methods, um, and then looking at the knock-on for design. So we were beginning to look at, at the links um, between different aspects of user-centered design. So the questions that we were asking was, um, how does big upfront contextual design or user research, how does it actually improve design? So there's still a very strong faith in user-centered design that if only you spend a large amount of time up front studying users tasks activities and everything else you'll end up with a, a fantastic design 
I've chaired the um, design challenge for the World Usability Initiative for the last three years, where we ask people to make that clear. It's been one two years running by learning scientists who do know how to make it clear. There are very strong traditions in learning sciences of hypothesizing what your design is going to do and testing it, things going back to pre and post testing. Um, but it is quite disappointing. The silver last year was uh, the Israeli Railways app, and that was a fantastic bit of, of user testing work. But they did a hell of a lot more. They did really beautiful visual design. They did a really fantastic social media campaign. Um, so it wasn't just um, studying users that uh, led that to um, to its success. So I think none of us, I mean, I've done a lot of, you, I've done a hell of a lot of design involving user research, but as to how it actually connects with the design, um, I think we're more confident than we should be. And certainly back when Steve was doing his PhD, um, it wasn't clear how these things connected. And they're certainly not generative. You know, this thing about implications for design that you do your user research and it tells you what to design again is a myth that still hasn't been busted as much as it should be. Um, Darren was concerned with um, how different methods find different usability problems, how reliably they're found, what's the role of each method, um, how comprehensive is each method, and when and why is it so. Um, Darren didn't complete his PhD, but nevertheless um, has got 600 citations, so uh, I think he, he certainly made his mark. And Alan Woolrich at Sunderland followed on. They overlapped at Sunderland. Darren was a postdoc there, postdoc without a doc, just like me. Um, and, and Alan, uh, who sadly died a few years ago, has, has, has left a, a very strong mark in the area. So let's look at what Steve did in his PhD. Uh, I've copied stuff from old slides, so I don't know if the sound's on on this. No, it's not, thank God. Um, these are all, these. Uh, what's great is these animations from 20 years ago still work. So this is um, Steve's editor for QOCs for Design Rationales. It was the early days of Java, and he loved it, JavaScript. And this was his LD tool, um, where basically he specified the links. And again, it, it's too dense to look at, but he kept records of the contextual focus of, of scenarios, contextual scenarios, QOCs from Design Rationale, an object model written in notation, I developed my PhD, and UAN that was developed by Rex Hartson, who was over here for a year with Phil. Um, and he looked at the explicit links between these contextual aspects of design and the design itself. And the widths of the lines here represent, so if you look at Steve's thesis, you'll see an appendix of all the links. Um, and we've got quite different routes going on here. This is the no-brainer, this is domain analysis. So there are stuff in the, the stuff in the contextual scenario. So if you're doing air traffic control, I can tell you for free without any consultancy charge, that system will have airplanes in it. They will have call signs, they'll have a flight number, they'll have a direction, they'll have an altitude, and they'll have an origin, they'll have a destination. No charge. These are the no-brainers. And a lot of Steve's stuff, he, he, he did a new, um, with a master's student, implemented a new admission system for the master's course, the conversion master's. So a lot of the no-brainer stuff here, Jack Carroll's early work on scenarios involved a lot of domain analysis for the scenarios. And this down here, the stuff that's making heavy use of the itty-bitty data, it was a chain of design rationales feeding through, and then a bit of it fed through the interaction model. None of this was enough to design the whole system at all, but a lot of the stuff he just filled in because he had to finish the system, and a lot of design sort of follows on from what you've done already. So these were direct transfer connections. These were argued connections. He also re -en reverse engineered the Olympic me messaging system. It was a smaller system, and he also, um, it was basically a voicemail system for athletes at the Los Angeles Olympic Games that IBM developed. And he used that in his evaluation. It was quite a tightly defined system that he could use with people doing the evaluation. So just going back to that slide, there were two types of, of connections here. There was direct transfer, that if it's in the domain, it's in the system, and that's not automatic. If you if you sit down and compare the contacts on your mobile phones, they've all got a different model of a contact. There's some things in there. Mine still defaults to the, if I put a phone number in, it defaults to work. Do you think, who on earth's got a work number these days? And it's not got favorite color in yet, but some of them get quite close. Um, and then these argued connections. So there were two very different ways of linking between context and design. 
Another one that Steve did in an earlier um, example um, was looking at how different aspects of context take you into different parts of the design space. So there's a classic analysis by Susanna Bodke and her PhD of notes in Word, of how when you're typing a note in in Word, it forces you to put in the, the symbol or the number or whatever before you put the text in. Susanna's argument is that your focus is on the text and you should put the text in first and then the footnote marker. However, if you actually go to the library and pull a load of books out and look at notes and footnotes and end notes and end of book notes, you can see that Word lets you do no end of ridiculous things. Like you can have symbolic end notes, you know, dagger, star, paragraph marker. Um, and what Steve argued was actually, you should be going from the domain model to, to the object model directly. And it, it produced a, a radically different solution. Susanna's was change the dialogue order Steve's was actually make notes like real notes. Um, and my brother's a retired civil engineer. Civil engineering papers are only notes. They're just numbered paragraphs. They don't do prose. Waste of time. What's key about this is unlike linear user centered design, until you've got the context and the design in place, you cannot see these connections. So the idea of context generating design or implying design, as Paul Durish wrote against in Kai 2006, you can only have implications for this design. You can't have implications for any design. If you've not thought of what the design is, there are no implications. It's not as if you look at the context and say, oh, I can see what I should be doing now. Oh, there's the app. It just doesn't happen. So joins can come from anywhere. So a lot of stuff in Steve's thesis were tacit craft loops that basically he'd got this far in the design and it was clear what the next step was and he put that in place. Um, some context, there was a lot of unused contextual information and we knew that already from work back at HUSAT in, in 1990 that they collected hundreds of user requirements for a CAD tool, virtually none of which were used. Um, so a lot of the stuff that you collect it doesn't get used. So we had a word with John Bennett because Steve had noticed that they hadn't considered noise. So the voice, the Olympic messaging system used outside phone booths. And uh, Steve said there's nothing in their descriptions of the design of how they consider noise. I had a chat with John Bennett about that. He said, no, we didn't. You know, so you can see it. One thing this does help with his reflection and saying, well, actually, we gathered that insight. We didn't do anything with it. They also arrived late in design. So David Gillespie had talked to Stephen through the official admission system, but as, the, as it was coming up to the start of the next academic year and he had to fill the course, he just had a box. And if there was a, still a place level, he'd just pick up the next thing in the box and make an offer without taking up references and doing those afterwards. So if, if Steve hadn't picked that up, there would have been a big misfit in this you know, typically bureaucratic system that sticks to one process. And... Um, can only be surface prototypes until Steve was doing the screen design and layout with Teresa in the office. It, it wasn't until he had a screen layout to talk through that he could really get a sense of what goes where. And he picked up further contextual insights there, particularly in the context of students ringing from Singapore and East Asia, out of time zone, expensive call, a lot of anxiety, wondering about getting accommodation and the rest. And the screen layout reflected what the priorities were in Teresa's experience with students on the phone. Um, so a join must exist before any join can make both ends. Um, so, I mean, the whole thing about the ISO standard now is it's still linear big up front. It can't support any of this until you've got the context and the design in the place. You can't reason about the relationship for it. So, and the other thing is that all development is concurrent after the first iteration. Once you've got round once, you've done everything. So from the second iteration onwards, you are unpicking and restitching. <clears throat> And if you've got a methodology that's got a little magic box that takes things in and pumps things out, you can't unstitch that. So there's famous quotes about, you know, no plan can go far in the first battle, that no phases can go far in the first iteration. Darren's work was um, looking at walkthroughs. And here the, the connections start getting interesting, that usage is a relationship between context and system. Or, or that's one way of thinking about it. You know, if you if you specify a task, you specify an activity, you, you've got turn taking between the user and the system. And what you're evaluating isn't the context or the system, you're evaluating the relationship between them. 
that's walkthroughs and user testing. If you're doing inspection, that may be like cognitive walkthrough. It, it may be based on looking at usage, but equally it's just based at looking at the system. Jacob Nielsen starts saying, oh, hasn't got one of them. Oh, hasn't got one of them. Oh, it's got one of them. It shouldn't. Um, and that's just direct. That's just, uh, that's just misfit again. And what Alan and other researchers at Sunderland came up with is the DARE model that showed all the, the forms of knowledge that get used during inspection and user testing. Drawing on knowledge of users, of tasks, of the domain, drawing on knowledge of design, drawing on technical knowledge, particularly with websites and back buttons and things like that, and drawing on knowledge of how users interact. And at Microsoft, why on Lee picked up that a lot of user testing in Office, with Office, was focused on problems that the, the tester had already picked up from inspection. In other words, they, they, they tried the system themselves, they weren't happy with something. And, you know, it's KGB style, you give us the charge, we'll find the evidence. They would then focus the user testing, not unreasonably, on where they saw the interaction problems. And then, Ken Dai told me, um, they would then have to give a heuristic to the programmer just to say it really, really was a problem. So this is a big file, a big slide, I won't go through all of it, but basically, evaluation is about finding filtering, fathoming, understanding what's happening, and finding and fixing. So some of the things Darren looked at was, is a usability problem just a point? Is it just a breakdown point? Because Darren's approach picked up things like, someone makes the same error one or two, you know, a few times, and then learns something and never makes that error again and learns something about the system and the process. We would regard that as a usability problem. Equally, you can get no breakdown at the time, but then havoc breaks out later on because they haven't done something that was essential. You know, like if you're rotating objects in, in, in office and you haven't grouped the objects before you rotate them, they all spin on the center. And to a, a novice user, things just break down there. There's very good work by Stuart Reed, who's an ethnomethodologist at, um, at Nottingham, um, who's been looking at the social construction of usability problems in, in real work. And then Ralph Molek's CUE series demonstrated, you know, pretty conclusively that if you give several um, usability teams the same system to evaluate, they, they come up with different results. So filtering is really important. And as I said, Alan's work showed quite clearly the sort of knowledge that's used in filtering. And um, both Darren Allen and others, particularly colleagues at Copenhagen, Caspar Hornbeck and Eric Flirkia, who are told never to say his name in Tyneside, um, came up with a range of um, resources that helped. Dennis Wixon made the comment in the CHI 2003 um, panel that finding problems is not what evaluation is about. There was a problem in Age of Empires where people couldn't move peasants in the tutorial. He said it only took two users to find that problem. It took another 20 to understand it. So, and again, this isn't just a craft loop within evaluation. You're drawing on a lot of knowledge, bringing in developers, bringing in other people's experience, interaction in games and the rest to try and work out what is going wrong with that game mechanic. Because if you can't move peasants, you can't play Age of Empires. And finding and fixing, as I said, involve a lot. And the DARE model stands for design, um, discovery and analysis resources. But I think what this got us to was just that most of the areas of knowledge and interaction design are in play at the same time. So by this point, we've got five different types of connection. Tacit, which STEM people don't really want to hear about a lot of the time. Um, but in a lot of Stephen's design decisions documented had no grounding whatsoever. It was still a good system, you know, evaluated well, but there was no contextual basis for them. And I don't know if we'd gone back how we would have done that. Um, there were the argued connections with design rationale. There were the articulated connections um, in evaluation, that interaction is an articulation of the, of the connections between a user and the system. Misfit, a classic one from ergonomics and human factors. Direct transfer, a classic one from software engineering, well established now. So we have a range of epistemic positions here. We have post hoc reasoning around design rationale. Um, we have uh, rational, 
while you're doing it. So things like misfit direct transfer, not so much post hoc as dumb hoc, if you've got your Latin. And then there's creative, and I won't translate the Latin there. <laughs> okay, so that got me well established as a research chair at Sunland with Darren there and building up a group. Um, and I then ended up, I did my damnedest to avoid it, directing a regional support cluster for the digital sector with an industrial board uh, who used terms like value proposition. You thought, what the hell is that? Um, and out of that, I actually got a Nesta fellowship coming out of that work. And again, I won't pick this apart at the moment. The main point of this slide is that actually there's more things in play and the set of connections is getting quite complicated. And I'll explain why evaluation is that shape when we get to it. So I'd hoped that fit was one, you know, going back to classic ergonomics of fitting the person or the man back then to the machine, that fit would get us a long way. And you could sort of see, you know, in terms of what you might need in a house in terms of heating and what a program will let you do essentially heating control, there's, there's clearly a mismatch here. He has a really old animation next. So back in the previous century, there were these things called checkbooks. Sounds off, thank God. So you'd go to the bank saying, I'm me, I'd like 50 pounds. You'd have a check written out and already signed and you'd have to prove that you're you and you'd do that by signing the back of the check. Oh, <laughs> the sound is working. <laughs> so what's that look like in, in terms of task structure? Well, you've got a Petri net here. These four things need to be done by the time before you hand over your checkbook and your card. It doesn't matter what order they're done in. And then it gets linear, you ask to sign the back of the check, and then you get everything back, the money, the checkbook, and the card because there's a human being on the other side who can actually look after all this stuff for you. When we went to cash machines, there were a lot of, so the only things that survive are signing that becomes a pin, presenting the book that becomes inserting the card. The amount doesn't suck change. You now have to say, I want cash, please. You don't have to do that when you hand a check over. It's pretty obvious that's what you want. Um, not only do you have to say the amount with a machine, you have to confirm it. Then you have to get your card back. Then you collect your cash. Now, these clearly don't match their different structures, their different temporal structures. But there's a big so what question, because clearly the sky hasn't fallen on our heads with cash machines. And when older people had trouble with cash machines, they just took their grandchildren with them and, and they would show them how to get money out. So I think what it shows is that sort of classic ergonomics notions of fit and misfit actually are not very predictive of, uh, of user experience. And that is where we start rendezvousing with value propositions. So how much is too much? I mean, how slow is too slow? So classic usability measures of efficiency, effectiveness, you can get the measure, but you, what you don't know is what's the threshold. How much is too much? How much is enough? What are the consequences of that misfit? How do we know what matters is when? And, and this is where I, I shifted my focus to value, having been pushed that way by working with people from industry. Um, and value propositions come into marketing around the late 70s. So they're not, they weren't massively new at the time. Um, so the thing about misfit, in classic ergonomics and human factors, misfit is a yes, no thing, and usability problems are a yes, no thing, but they're not. And you can't consider them in isolation. You've got to look at them in terms of the bigger picture. And that just saying there's a misfit or a problem isn't enough. We need to violence them. So it, it and severity scales and usability, a lot of those have been utterly dismal five point scales that actually do not speak to the value proposition of what's being developed at all because they're trying to be generic. So this is in Kai 2005 where. I try and rejig a process, and it's the first time I've gone concurrent. So what I decided was that actually you should be able to work out your evaluation criteria for your, event, your, your intended value statements, and then those evaluation criteria feed both into your evaluation work and into your value delivery scenarios. And then you can pop your interaction design out of that, and then eventually you come back here, this final phase, which I called iteration. 
So I didn't regard iteration as just getting back on the roundabout. It actually was a, a period of, of conscious reflection and deliberation and judgment from which you decided what needed fixing. And there's feedback to everything from here. And that is in the ISO, that went in the ISO standard about 10 years ago that iteration, no, it was, it was 20. So iteration wasn't just going around in circles all the time, that after evaluation, you could return to any phase. And it's that thing about, you know, you can only, you can only be linear once. So that got into really questioning the twin pillars of user-centered design of contextual research and usability engineering as being enough. They're clearly important, but they're not really what cuts it at the end of the day. So the values in play with usability were tiny compared to what matters in terms of value propositions for apps and systems and websites. There was also at the time a value sensitive design was kicking off with Batya Freeman and, and, and values and value are not the same thing. I put a big V on values that value is about benefits. Value is often is more about obligations. They're heavier, they're bigger, they're human values, they're substantive values, they're fundamental values. And a lot of people in the field have tried to elevate the small set of values of, of justice or whatever above everything else, um, which isn't particularly helpful because they're just far too abstract to design with. Value is positive, generally, um, but in fact, you want to look at balance of worth. You want to look at balance of benefits over sacrifices. And these are terms from economics. The only problem is in classical economics, they get collapsed into the concept of utility, which becomes this, this opaque box. And you can't see from that value put on utility which bit of its benefit and which bit of its sacrifices. User experience at the time was greatly extending the set of design values coming into play. So things like, you know, fun, play, ludic design. And that balance of worth really is a strategic consideration, is to positive over negative experiences. So there's things like Photoshop, Alias Wavefront are absolute pigs to use. So there's a lot of music editing software and composition software, but people do fantastic things with them. And they will take, they will take the sacrifices for the gains. So just a simple look at usability problems and poor user experience does not give you a, a good, a, a full enough grasp on, on, on the value of, of design work. And we want, it's not just experiences we want to look at, we want to look at outcomes as well. We want to go beyond immediate UX. And we want to look at the balance of outcomes over experiences that in some applications, it's at, it really is outcomes, 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 alias Photoshop, and others like games and, you know, to a certain extent, things like e-learning experience is crucial as well. But these are all judgments, all strategic judgments about what balance you're after. So at this point, you know, the great thing about being a design department is just sat out with a load of people that really understand the design research literature. And I, I looked at John Heskett's Toothpicks and Logos, which is also the Oxford Very Short uh, Introduction to Design. A lot of this was written up in Altkai. And Heskett says, well, you can try and divide, des define design. It's not going to get you anywhere. But what does get you somewhere is thinking about where design decisions come from. And there are outcomes about decisions about four things, about means or systems in our case, digital artifacts. And I'll come back later to those two other words, wh why they've come in. Ends, which is about design purpose. Why would, what's the strategic value? And, and user centered design, just an absolute desert here. No talk of value, no talk of what matters, no talk of what makes a difference. Just this very objective, this is the context, these are the problems, get on with it. Um, and ways of actually connecting with design purpose. I, I, I'd, I'd had some initial ideas before I went to uh, Microsoft Cambridge for a while, um, but we really took them forward there. So what I did was move UCD to a worth focus, or just WOFO, which adds this new design arena. Who benefits is in uh, Heskett, but in fact, areas like design against crime that some of my college, colleagues in, in Northumbria are very strong on, you actually want, you, you've got malefisheries. You want to make life difficult for criminals and, you know, areas like cybersecurity as well. You are designing against, not designing for. So I came up with the notion of any fisheries, which is the mixture and, of uh, beneficiaries and malefisheries. And, and accessibility, unfortunately, often ends up with, with malefisheries. So if you don't take a broad enough view of your beneficiaries, you will miss things in the nature of evaluation. So... 
The, during my Nesta fellowship, I finished up at Microsoft Research. I worked on the Family Archive program. This was a bit of digital furniture for curating um, both physical and digital heritage because increasingly um, important stuff was in a digital format. One of Dave Kirk's questions was, if there was a fire in your house, what's the one thing you would take out? And the younger people said the hard disk drive with all their photos on and all their music. So this is the, 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 the sort of the value proposition space for the family archive around people, place, and things, making, <laughs> make, making for a happy family, a nicer home, and, and looking after your treasures. And the ones marked new and newly were actually generous. Basically, no one had asked for that necessarily in the field work. Um, we couldn't see a competitor product around at the time, like uh, Google, Google's Picasso. Um, or whoever's Picasso was. Um, so there were some things we could see were actually were, you know, unique selling points in marketing jargon. Um, but the thing about generosity is going beyond what the contextual data says to the opportunities that you as a creative designer can see. And whilst a lot of this was, was grounded in Dave Kirk's fieldwork, a lot of it actually came from creative discussions um, over things like this. This is a word sketch. So you've got design arenas, you've got positive outcomes at the top, negative outcomes at the bottom, you've got user experiences in the middle, and then you've got various parts of the artifact space, materials, features, and qualities. And we just move these things around, talking about connections and relationships between them. So the connections here are implicit, they're not explicit. The adjacency applies it, and I'd just scribble over the joins, and then I'd go back and put stick this stuff on phone call and get it laid out, and then I'd, I'd put it into Office as, as a diagram. And the diagrams I did were like this. Uh, this is from a, um, a design theatre paper from Kai. But this is a worth map. It's based on another um, hierarchical value models from marketing, where they look at um, forging relationships between product features and, uh, and, and consumer values. So. Here's the materials, here's the um, features, here's the qualities, there's the experiences, and there's the outcomes. And this block here, that's an interrupted. So a lot of online systems, you, you, you pay before you consume. So booking travel tickets, concert tickets, things like that. So all you can get to on a website is the idea of got a good plan. And, and companies like EasyJet did very well early on. You could see their e booking emails were essentially... This, this list of things that have gone wrong when people have turned up to get on their flight. And they have this quite detailed instructions, unlike Ryanair, of, you know, if, if we want you to get on the flight and this will only happen if. And it was very clear in their emails. So, that you know, the feature they had there was the email confirmation of booking. And this red one here is one example of a means end chain that basically says, if you build this on that with those qualities, you'll end up here and you'll avoid these bad things as well. And it's a conjecture, but that's another form of connection. That's an articulated one. And interestingly, it's in a space that we're very good at in HCI because it's reasoning about interaction. It's, it's a very high level model of interaction. It's close to a user journey um, in, in service design, but it's quite detailed in its breakdown of the artifact. Okay, last bit now. So we really have to get away from that little magic man in the box. And it is a man <laughs> who's saying, you know, with my process and with my methods, if you follow the scripts and, and stick to the rules and do it all properly, I guarantee that you will have a, a system on time within budget and to specification. Uh, there's a very famous Danish guy, Bengt, Blue beer, or something like that. It's a right mouthful. Um, he's one of the most cited people in the social sciences. Um, has done a lot of work around large infrastructure projects and why they're always over budget, over time, and under under benefit. So things need to be concurrent, even to the point of these four design arenas. So artifacts, beneficiaries, purpose evaluation, they actually fuse. So there's some classic work in design that shows that people aren't thinking separately about the artifact, the beneficiaries and the purpose. It, you, you, they're talking about things in a way, one of the classic examples is Dawson Heights, a building in, in South London, where 
the architect MacDonald, Kate MacDonald, I think, just had this vision all at once about how she would put this building on this hill in South London, laid out in such a way to deliver these benefits. And it's hard to pick apart. If you look at the briefs for the student design competitions in Kai, their concourses as well, it's all mixed up. There's, there isn't a separation of, of context, design and the rest. We need to connect these things continuously. And the advantage of having explicit separate connections is that there's no unpicking to do as you go around the iterative loop each time. You know, if you did have these massive mechanical methods, you know, sausage machines where you put the inputs in and you get the outputs out. And it's got a strategic worth focus. So as I said, I moved to a design school. There's all this stuff. Interestingly, I read this book. I taught a short unit in 1996 here on the, on the MSC and Advanced Information Systems. It was Keith's module. Keith, and I went to the library. I pulled these books out. I read Lawson. I understood it. I found my slides a while back. It's on there. And then I forgot it again after teaching. So I had actually seen a lot of this before. Um, loads of books you can look at. Kay's Door is probably the best right in this area. A popular tour of science and action down there, because when designers read this, they say, yeah. Whereas when you write the same sort of books about scientists, they get very upset and you get science balls. No, 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 we don't do like that. That's not true. That's not true. We do it like our school teachers said. Marion Petrie's got a lovely little book here that shows that software designers behave the same as fashion designers. That really upset. You know, what are you talking about fashion for? Because it's designers saying, and, and, and you know, the software engineer, no, we can't be like fashion. You like fashion. John Hegarty on advertising, Kay's Dorst again. Lovely content, compendium volume from the University of the Arts London. Grace and Perry's got pieces in there where they, they team up choreographers um, with, with, with sculptors and the rest and get these really interesting dialogues going about the creative stance. So this thing about connections, which I think has been really ignored, it, you know, Charles Eames says it's the quality of connections that's the key to quality per se. So I did a keynote last year in Brazil, and uh, these are the eight habits of highly creative practice. Creating, well, yeah, you understand that. But in fact, an awful lot of STEM value sets are against creation, they're against judgment. They don't accept something that just comes out of the blue. The evaluation sales, you know, it turns out to be a massive success, a brilliant insight. But, oh, no, it's not properly grounded. You know, you've not got data for that. Um, coaxing design teams is really important. And this is from um, the design and the innovation literature. There's a classic paper by um, Nonaka and Takeuchi um, in Harvard Business Review 86. It's the paper that Jeff Sutherland read and came up with Scrum. It has six characteristics of, of successful innovation work, of which Jeff Sutherland got one and a half. He got the self-organizing teams and he got a bit on learning organizations, but he did not get subtle management control again. What was lovely about Worth sketches at Microsoft is that different disciplines could be around the same large table, understanding how their bit of the design space fitted together. Curating is really important, keeping track of what you've done, contemplating about reflections. And it's not about phases, it's about episodes. And, and another one of my research students, Malcolm Jones, his PhD had some beautiful examples of how design work can look very chaotic and then it just slowly coalesces and just all comes to a head. He called it a keystone idea that tied it all together. So coalescing is really important. I mentioned about, um, about Dawson Heights. That paper is about the primary generator. Um, right, again, I'm so amazed. I can't quite remember the um, author of that. But she actually pointed out that in early design work, this stuff's all fused. Co-evolution is critical. It's in the Wicked Problems paper. It's just a shame they called them wicked and called them problems. Otherwise, they were absolutely on message. Connecting is important, integrating, and, and being generous. You know, the best design surprises, delights. It gives people what they didn't think was possible and weren't expecting. And, you know, Bill Buxton asked someone at Trek once, what would you think of a designer that came to a meeting with three ideas? And the guy said, sacked basically, you know, and you come to a software design meeting with three ideas and just making it far too complicated. Can't we just start here? So this is tracking. This is from Jenny George's PhD, tracking the four design arenas, what she thought was going to happen before an activity, what actually happened. 
This is from Eindhoven, where I taught the professional doctorate students in a couple, took a couple of design sprints with them, also took the master's students on week-long sprints. This is them tracking how the four design arenas unroll and what's good, yellow, what's bad, red, and what they need to do, blue. And uh, this is the reflection of a Ukrainian computer science who was on that professional doctorate of science. She said, you know, you just drew four circles and called that a framework. You know, that's not hard enough. That's not hard computer science like what I know. But she said, actually, now I've used it. It might look simple and intuitive. But when you accept some of these intuitive things, suddenly the chaos of the creative work clears up and you see the things before you actually have to do. And these students were doing really effective work within three days not in a, a highly choreographed Google sprint that takes five days and is very, very stage managed. They were really working independently after the second or third day. Um, I'm aware of time. This is just to get a couple more connections. And Jenny George actually skipped the diagrams and just went straight to tables. There's something in marketing called a feature benefit table that she was actually quite close to. And the key thing about this, these are just assumed. There's no argument, no articulation, but she did refine them later. She also translated from the, the from design purpose to evaluation measures as well. That was quite interesting. So wrapping up now, there are at least five modes of connection. I thought of a 10th one recently, but I didn't write it down. And that was a reflective one. I was reading someone else's work and I thought, oh, no, I've not got that one yet. But what's interesting is back in 97, Stephen Clark got four of these, which is pretty good going. At Microsoft, we got a couple more. Jenny George got a couple more. The one that ha it haven't got here comes from Windows. When Windows 95, the redesign had only four goals. I can't remember the fourth, but it was to let people print, to let people install new hardware, and to let people write a letter. They were the design. That's where the start button comes from, because Windows 3.1 with its program manager and file manager, people couldn't do anything. And it, it, I don't know if you can remember, anyone who's seen a Windows 3.1 print dialog knows. Like it's, it's like trying to, you know, it's like, it was just immensely bureaucratic before you could actually print the damn thing. So wrapping up now, the dots and the joins. I, I like working with the four design arenas from John Heskett, but you can have any you want. There will always be an artifact there. So this thing about user-centered design, the only center in design is design, period. Everything else is memoranda. It's things to be considered, things you can consider. But if there's no artifact there, you are not designing, period. And you're not doing design ethnography either. You're doing ethnography. And then any fisheries purpose. I call it artifact because the bulk of the time you're not dealing with an artifact, you're dealing with an antifact. You're dealing with some sort of prototype or vision. And artifact is like muz. It's between Mrs. and Ms. And uh, you sort of crunch it up the same way. When you join artifacts to memoranda, you get axia facts. You're not making a thing anymore. More, you're making value. Axiology is the study of value, and it's it's conspicuous by its accent in Western philosophy. So we have these nine connection modes so far. We have one, two, three, and four-way connections, which are directed. Connections, two connections, which are covered in my old Kai 2010 paper. So there's no closure, which, again, is bad news for people of an engineering mindset because they love saying all. Oh, have we got all the requirements? No. Have we got all the usability problems? No. You haven't got all the connections either, but hopefully... You've got all the valuable ones. And these resulted from critical practices within research for design, through design, for design. So in other words, doing research, using a design process to discover things for design and evaluating that by looking back um, at your traces and your tracking. So I'm aware of time now, so I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly skip this. I think language is critical. I think my background, my, I did history part one at Cambridge, then education part two. And I think this critical sensitivity to language in humanities is critical because otherwise you will get locked in by the vocabularies you're using problem, solution, systematic, rigorous, generate, imply. Those vocabularies will hem you in. They're not useless and they're not always dangerous, but if that's all you've got, you really are hemming yourself in. And uh, Alan Badiou, who's quite wacky most of the time, but he says avoiding sutures that you should embrace all his conditions, science, politics, arts, and love. And you might think, love? Well, actually, Bill Verblank told me about donative design. And the best design is always a gift, not a purchase. And that generosity is about giving people things that they never thought of. Um, so again, we'll skip the philosophy here. But there's this tension between a substantive ontology 
which is very popular in computer science about the world full of objects and attributes and qualities. This fixed world and causation is about how these things interact. There are relational ontologies, which are more to do with connections. Um, and again, Badu, whilst he is wacky a lot of the time, started thinking in terms of multiples and parts and the dynamics. So if you stop thinking of dots and joins in isolation and think of them together, that's when you get things like concourses. And it, it really does open things up. So in summary, and thank you for your patience, innovative design requires concurrent attention to dots and joins, which are called design arenas and connections. We can't progress only one dot at a time. So the whole thing about linear structured methodologies is that it's managerialism. And the, the mythology of engineering design management goes back to, to military engineering in the Second World War, where everything went wrong. And it went wrong because they had no managers. And you sort of think, why did anyone ever believe that? Um, and we can't progress method in isolation. We have to think of um, how they combine. As I said, several creation modes. And we can come up, I think once we've looked at these different connection modes, we can start thinking about approaches and resources and support of them. And the ones that myself and collaborators and others quite independently developed, the Orange Family Pack, which was a major product for Orange on the continent, was developed using world flux approaches. They're currently working on FinTech still with a worth focus. They're not doing any of the explicit connection stuff, but they are using implicitly and they've got a focus. Uh, a planning app in France, Calibri, was also developed with a worth focus. In Germany, at one of the uh, Fraunhofer Institutes, they're doing policy development on privacy with it. Um, there are postgraduate research students, projects around where they've used it end to end and research projects as well in Finland. And the South African one involved uh, Karen Reino when she was here. That was on um, mobile phones for, for the elderly, used a worth focused approach. I think looking out at the big bad world there, despite these clear examples that this stuff can work and can be valuable, um, that tacit work still dominates mainstream practice. Um, you, there's low use of resources for tracking and reflection. And I think in software, this is about need for speed that limits reflection and retrospectives. Um, but I would argue that uh, from my experiences that big wofo is worth it. And uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks so much for the nice talk. We have a lot of time for questions. Yeah, hi. So the um, period you cover up from the 80s to now is almost 40 years. Yeah. Technology, <laughs> technology has changed enormously. Yeah. Like when you talk about the interface, the interface with yeah. the underlying technology has changed enormously. How stable and how robust these uh, principles of approaches are? with respect to this major change, changes in technology? I think you can actually, these approaches actually make it much easier to innovate with new technologies because you can be focused on opportunities. What are the opportunities from these new technologies? What value do they have? I had a, a really useful chat once with Schumann Zai over at um, IBM where he was very disappointed that ShapeWriter had not had the impact that he'd hoped um, but he'd only ever thought of ShapeWriter in the context of a mobile phone. He hadn't thought of in the context of, say, playground games and things like that. Um, so I think technology is a nuisance in HCI because we have to keep up with it. But I don't, whilst I say that things, you know, that the only real sentence in design is design, um, I, I don't think that technology dominates uh, I, and, and, and I think the key thing about balances can be anything. I can imagine I can imagine projects where the technology is absolutely central and it's driving everything. I can also imagine projects where it's absolutely peripheral. And certainly there were a lot of things with the family archive because I had an early version of Surface, the butcher's block with all the innards inside. It was quite deep. Um, when later versions of Surface came out, it became much more viable in things like school environments. So some of the some of the changes that came to serve to the family archive when I was there. One of the things was they we added the microphone. And uh Abby San said, there's no user requirement for that. I said, well, without a microphone, you can't do this. So they put it in. And uh, what they found in the home study is one one child started making animations with their their, their furry toys. 
and and you and basically using the microphone to tell a story and they then um a, 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 an intern who was over from china microsoft china then developed that into a, a, a version for school use where they're basically were doing stop motion animation uh, with a surface device so i don't know if i've directly answered your question i don't I remember Richard Sullivan, the topographer from Reading once, and we were in some strategic UK meeting. This was in the 80s, and he blew up at all the computing and HCI people. He was a topographer. He said, in my career, he said, I've been through hot metal. I've been through liner type. You know, he just went through all the technologies. I've been through vector. I've been through bitmap. And he just get on with it. So uh, I, uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, it, it can be, a, it, it, you know, it, it's the classic it depends question. But I don't I, I don't think there's anything about a new technology. I think John Heskett's analysis is probably the best one around. Um, if you look at definitions of design, none of them are as comprehensive as his. And um, as I said, they're the four design arenas I work with. If there's a fifth or sixth one or you want to change it, that's <laughs> not the end of the world. I, you know, I include the planet as a beneficiary. So a lot of Ron Wackery stuff about post-human design, you can accommodate it there. You're just basically changing the balance of stakeholders and and and, and making the planet more prominent than people. Simone. Um, hello from one of the co-teachers of HDI4 now. Okay. <laughs> Look at uh, you. Along with, uh, That's a Matthew gift. Thomas. That's a gift. <laughs> but one of the things yeah. that... Um, I find um, going back to sort yeah. of what you said around education yeah. um, and pretending we are yeah. computer scientists. I think a lot of what we teach now yeah. uh, around HCI in the CS curriculum yeah. involves, you know, the contextual research yeah. and the output mm -hmm. and design gets kind of left out. Mm. Um, do you have any suggestions how to re-inject design education into a CS curriculum? So Cambridge has got a design degree from next year. That's come out of the manufacturing engineering tripos. Um, it's the only tripos in Cambridge taught by an Oscar winner, James Moultrie, who has Oscars for um, cinematography lens design. That has been a studio-based course from the outset. Um, you just have to have a studio module. Um, Olin College in the States is really worth looking at. That's a small engineering college that's all studio based. Um, and also look at some some of the creative computing. Goldsmiths, for example. Um, I mean, the way Phil and I got stuff in the curriculum was we just put it in. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't ask, we didn't tell anyone. But certainly there was a strong design element to HCI3. Um, and it is, you know, it's that it's that studio tradition. And, and until you're in a design school, you don't really get it. I thought I got it from reading Lawson. I thought I got it from my Nesta fellowship. My, my mentor was Gillian Crampton Smith, and uh, her husband Phil Tabor, ex professor at the Bartlett, tagged along. You know, so I got two fantastic mentors for the price of one. And it was quite clear from interactions with them that I didn't get it. But you know, when you're in a studio three hours at a time with a bunch of design students, where you're putting some chalk and talk teaching in there amongst everything else. I think that's how you have to get it. So I would go and try and spend... So I think there's still a design course going joint between Glasgow College of Art and Mechanical Engineering here. Is it still there? I think so. It's worth looking at how they do it. Um, a lot of, you know, they turn out a lot of really good medical equipment designers because they can do the mechanical and electrical and they can do the design side of it. And they're, they're very much in demand. Um, so I would go and watch and then just do it and just, you know, like Phil and I, don't tell anyone. No one's going to complain, you know, make up some marking criteria. I mean, the filament team, when I was head of media and communication design. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, you can still do it. No, but Fulham and TV just let students do as many projects as they want in their final year. And they just submitted a portfolio. I was director of this. I did the editing on that. I did the sound on this. You know, I did the script on that. And they just sort of, you know, <laughs> come up with a final grade. I mean, I don't know if anyone's found them out now, but uh, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I say make up some marking criteria, but don't make it obvious. <laughs> Turn out the criteria they like to see and then mark to something else. <laughs>
I mean, this is the thing about creative disciplines. You know, the, the nonsense about structured methods and and and, and uh, project management is the idea that you can plan in advance something that no one's done before and no one knows what they're doing. It's just a nonsense. Another one of my colleagues is very strong on innovation. He's just retired. Working at Procter & Gamble and one of the managers there said, you know, I really need to know whether this is going to work or not. And she said, you can't, you know. He was, you know, as a manager, he was running scared of being involved with an R&D project that fails. Another one of my neighbours used to be head of R&D at Schlumberger. And, yeah, I think embracing failure and valuing failure is a key part of, of, of creative practice. And, you know, maybe engineering mindsets aren't happy with that. Steve. Um, I have two questions, but mm -hmm. um, you can <laughs> try and comment on them separately. Yeah. Um, it, I may, of course, have not taken in enough of your talk directly, but mm -hmm. what seems to me a, a glaring absence in yeah. what you said is that although it wasn't stressed very much, right from the earliest days of HCI, I remember Don Norman, for instance, pointing out yeah that the first commercial spreadsheet yeah. was designed for someone doing their household accounts. Yeah. But actually it was instantly repurposed by yeah. users to forward looking. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that you what you said is all assumes you've got a brief fix in advance. No, because the brief check the whole thing about this is they can all change. So, I mean, repurposing is something you do a lot of the time. So the example of the animation um, configuration for, my, for the family archive was clear repurposing. Um, I think repurposing is a lot easier in this framework because you can just, getting purpose right is really difficult and you should expect it to be constantly evolving. So the thing about a wicked problem, grossly misnamed, is you don't know what the problem is until you've accepted the solution. So problem solution is completely the wrong vocabulary for wicked problems. And they're also wild, the opposite You're of tame. You're calling it a problem rather than... I'm not calling it a problem. <laughs> the wicked problem people called it a problem. That was a mistake. I still yeah. don't really understand how you think you've dealt with the fact that designers might just not know what this is going to be used That's for. okay. No, but... I know it's okay. Yeah. I know it's very important. So you just have no P there for a while. That just in, in your swim lanes, there'd be no P. You'd be having an experiment. You would start off with a new technology or a new design insight, and you would have a go with it, and you could work out what's it. And, and a lot of innovation it is about repurposing, of taking one technology and using it for something else. So I actually think it's it doesn't get in the way of repurposing or delayed purposing in the way that classic linear requirements engineering does. So, of course, we're still around yeah. today for some time, so if mm -hmm. you can have a chat, feel free to approach him. Are we okay staying in this room? Uh, I think we have until 2 30. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, there was supposed to be catering, but unfortunately, it didn't show up yet, so we're figuring out what's going on. There should be some cakes here at some point. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, cakes talks. There was a thing. <laughs> yeah.